Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to be sharing today on a subject called the Covenant, Everlasting Covenant, and what Yahuwah said about it and what that has to do with us. This will be a part one, and uh, we'll see how far we get today. I'll try to take us about an hour and a half. Um, I know it's going to be an ongoing thing because it's kind of a deep study through the scriptures. And so I thank you for coming and checking out the Covenant of Yahuwah. The following two memes are from one of our sisters in Yahuwah. Her name is Mitzi Brown, and she always shares the word of Yahuwah and his name. This is from Psalm 138.2. Yahuwah, you have magnified your word and your name above all. And this one uh, she did says, Yahuwah, you must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. This is how he understood our ancestors to be, to be, and how he understands many of us to be. The Hebrew word for covenant is berit. Often it is pronounced as brit or just brit. Here's a word made of two Hebrew words that you are most likely familiar with. Brit is covenant, ish is man, so British means covenant man. Today, we're going to begin to look at a subject in our restoration series, Covenant, Everlasting Covenant, and what Yahuwah said about it. Why? Because it's our Father's words and His Son's words, and it has very much to do with who we are and who we must be, and who we must become. Most of us have the awareness that we came from Adam and Eve, or Adam, which means I will bleed, and Hawa, which means life giver. That's her real name. Uh, and most are, are most are aware that we came from Noah or Noak, which means rest. That's his real name. But from Noak, we had three uh, who had three sons. There is a division of lineage. Obviously, there's only three brothers. In the English, we were taught that their names were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But their names are Et Shame, Et Ham, and Et Yafet. Et Shame means name fame, character, renown. Et ham means hot and father-in-law. And et yafet means expansion. So we need to talk a little bit about the olive ta. That's these letters here. These are English letters that um, are place markers for Hebrew letters, the olive and the ta. The et means essentially um, what the olive and omega represents in the Greek in Revelation. So for an, expl an explanation of the Aleph Ta and what it means in Hebrew, we're going to turn to William Sanford's, um, what he has shared on his website here, Aleph Tav Scriptures, and he's the editor of the Messianic Aleph Tav Scriptures. I, it's an amazing book. Uh, a lot of research has gone into it, and it's done, it's, there's none like it. And he says this, Personally, I still feel I have only scratched the surface of understanding this symbol, the Aleph Ta or the et it's pronounced, for that, for there is much that remains a mystery, and I am forever reminded of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 2. If anyone thinks that he knows somewhat, he does not yet know as he should know. But if anyone loves Elohim, this one is known by him. So here we are sharing some of the vast amount of research Brother William Hatch Sanford Jr. has done on these two letters as they, as um, they appear thousands of times in the Hebrew word of Yahuwah. A quick side note, though Brother Sanford writes Tav and says Tav, he also points out in his writing and has told me also the correct pronunciation and English spelling translation of the modern Hebrew letter Vav, he says, or Wa as I understand it and call it, has been argued over for hundreds of years. It is more than likely a Wa in Hebrew rep English representation and sound, which to me is no different than a wa. For instance, Yahuwah and Yahuwah sound the same. It doesn't matter how you spell them in English or transliterate them in English. They sound the same. People say there is no W in Hebrew. That is true. There's also no A to Z in Hebrew. Those are English letters, not Hebrew letters. I believe it is not the transliterated English letter that is the issue. Instead of arguing about what English letters are or are not in Hebrew, we could just learn the Hebrew. After all, one day, Yahuwah will return to us the pure language. As he says here, this is Zephaniah 3, 9, 
for then I will turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of Yahuwah to serve him with one consent. My research and understanding agrees with what Brother Sanford is also saying here, that there is no V sound in ancient Hebrew. The V sound is a modern sound that did not originate with Yahuwah um, in his ancient Hebrew, giving the ancient families coming out of early times and on through the Egyptian captivity, he gave them no V sound to use. Brother Sanford also says the Aleph and the Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Consequently, in Aramaic, John would have been saying, Yehushua HaMashiach is the Aleph and the Ta. It begs the question, why would John make such prophetic and profound statements concerning the Aleph Ta symbol if it was not to profound, not a profound significance to believers in their day? Could John have been proclaiming that the Aleph and the Ta, the first and the last, was actually the Et symbol used in Genesis 1-1, and we're going to see it there, and consequently throughout the Tanakh? I personally believe that if you cannot, if you connect the dots of everything John states in his gospel and in the book of Revelation, the answer to this question is yes. What John was trying to reveal to those who had ears to hear is from the beginning, Yahushua was with Elohim and was Elohim, and that Yahuwah, Father, by his Ruach HaKodesh, worked together by, both with and through Yahushua as one. And in Genesis 1-1, it says, uh, Bereshit, bara, that's the word created, Elohim, et, the heavens, and et, the earth, wet, the earth. Genesis 1-1, in fact, is where the first Aleph Ta and first Wa Aleph Ta, there you see it there, Wa Aleph Ta, character symbol, symbols appear, symbolizing Yahushua's divine presence, his divinity with Yahuwah, Father, as the Son and Creator. I believe confirmation that the Aleph Ta in Genesis 1-1 is Yahushua, is easily acknowledged in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. The same was in the beginning with Elohim. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Also, John 5.39, Yahushua said, you, you search the scriptures, the Tanakh is what he was speaking of, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Um, Brother Sanford goes on to say, I am convinced that the Aleph Ta, the Et symbol in Hebrew text, is Yahushua's mark, his fingerprint, which proclaims his presence. Confirmation of this is the powerful prophetic verse in Zechariah 12.10, and they shall look to me, and that word me there is, is the Aleph Ta, and they shall look to Et, whom they have pierced. This is but one of hundreds of verses which I believe confirms Yahushua as the Aleph Ta symbol used in the Tanakh. He goes on to say, Consequently, if the Aleph Ta symbol represents Yahushua, then it also represents the word of Elohim, as John states in John 1.14, and can be linked also to judgments or divine decision from the Yah head as rendering either a blessing or a curse, According to Hebrews 4.12, For the word of Elohim is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do, implying as a two-edged sword that he can cut and render a blessing or cut and render a curse. This is why we see the Aleph Ta, the Et symbol, in association with Yahuwah Father, used in hundreds of places concerning judgments. One example in is Genesis 13.10, uh, destroyed Et. So we have Yahuwah Et destroyed Sodom, Wa Et Gomorrah. Other examples which confirms this are Genesis nineteen fourteen, Isaiah thirteen nineteen, Jeremiah fifty forty, and Amos four eleven. Just one example of the Aleph Ta, the Et symbol, rendering a blessing is Exodus twenty, and blessed 
day. So it says Yahuwah et, and blessed day, the Shabbat. Case in point, there are many examples of the Aleph Ta symbol being placed where it pertains to the importance of subject matter regarding covenant relationship with the Yah head. Regarding people, persons, places, or things, and even rendering judgments concerning curses or blessings, for example, in the life of Jacob and Esau in Genesis twenty five twenty eight, both Jacob and Esau have Aleph Ta symbols in front of their names in the beginning of their life together. But the last time we see the Aleph Ta symbol used in front of Esau's name is Genesis twenty seven one. On that day, Isaac calls to Esau to ask him to hunt him some savory meat so that he, Isaac, may bless Esau. Even though Esau's name is used another 78 times in the Torah, the Aleph Ta symbol continues to be only in front of Jacob's name and not Esau's. Because the covenant blessing of the birthright given to, by Messiah was removed from him. So he's saying the covenant blessing of the birthright given by the Messiah was removed from Esau. The reason Esau has no Aleph Ta symbols in front of his name after Genesis 27.1 is explained by Moshe in Genesis 25.34, for so despised Esau his et birthright. So that et is in there in 25.34 as Moshe is explaining, explaining that um, Yahuwah despised Esau, uh, for so despised Esau his birthright, rather. Another per perfect example of the birthplace, or I'm sorry, let me move back that up. Another perfect example of the placement of the Aleph Ta symbol is in the book of Ruth. Ruth's name is used 12 times in the book. The first 10 times there is no Aleph Ta symbol in front of her name. After she is redeemed by Boaz, the next two times her name is used and all, uh, is used, an Aleph Ta symbol is in front of her name each time. These are just two examples, but it seems quite obvious that the Aleph Ta symbol shows a connection of covenant relationship with the Yah head. So conclusion here, it is important to become familiar with the original Paleo-Hebrew meaning of each of these letters preceding the Aleph Ta symbol to grasp a more profound understanding of what the author was trying to express relative to the Yahed. So um, what he's talking about here, I um, edited out some of what he has here because it was just so extensive, and I invite you all to go check it out. Um, it, it, it was a very good study, but I just had to um, shorten what we, what we can do here. Um, but he shares some of the places that Olive Ta shows up in the scriptures with a letter that precedes it. So here, when it shows up with a Zion Aleph Ta, uh, it's translated as the Zion means to cut from the Aleph Ta. So when you see Aleph Ta, think the strength of the covenant, because the Aleph means strength, and the Ta means the covenant. It also means completion, and whereas the Aleph means plan. So from the plan to the completion is the Aleph Ta, or the strength of the covenant. And then Yehushua also told us he is the Aleph in the Ta. Mem Aleph Ta, uh, Mem means to flow from Aleph Ta. Bet means come inside of the Aleph Ta, the strength of the covenant, or Yehushua. Lamed means authority from Aleph Ta. Pei means to communicate from Aleph Ta. Zadi Aleph Ta means Zadi. Zadi means righteousness from Aleph Ta. Sheen means consuming fire from when it's with Aleph Ta. The Wa Aleph Ta means to connect or bridge to the Aleph Ta, who is the strength of the covenant Yehushua. He Aleph Ta, He means to reveal from Aleph Ta, a revelation from Aleph Ta. There Let's see, was I going to read this? Let me see. I don't think I was going to read this part. This is all here. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll just give you guys a quick, you can um, pause it and read um, each section here. So you can pause it here if you're interested in reading this page. And we'll pull it up to here for a moment. 
and just pause it and read it if you're interested. It's very interesting. It's just that we didn't have time to go through all of this. So I'm pausing where you can just hit the pause button. And this is all on my Facebook page, so it can be read there if we're Facebook friends. And I always try to invite you guys to be friends on Facebook if you are. It's a great place to fellowship with those people who are walking in the name of Yahuwah. They have left um, the things that they found were traditions, and they are seeking after the truth and walking in that truth, which some of these things are the things that, that we now walk in. Manifestations of Et Yehushua, the Messiah. When asking a well-known rabbi in Israel, known for his website, Ask the Rabbi, and this is a Brother Sanford speaking, what he thought the Aleph Ta symbol meant, he stated, in fact, the sages do deduce laws from the places where the Aleph Ta appears. The rule is that it is meant to include something above and beyond the limited definition of the word. Rabbi S.R. Hirsch explains that it is related to the word os or sign of the covenant. And uh, by the way, some of the the Hebrew speaking people uh, use a S sound instead of a T. So this is probably the same word as the, et, the Aleph Ta is right here, the sign of the covenant. The thing stands for something more than itself. And Brother Sanford goes on to say, I must say I totally agree with both these men. Surprisingly, the Aleph Ta symbol is found in the first five books of Moshe, the Torah, 2,622 times. That is over one-third of the total number found in the complete Tanakh, not including the Wa Aleph Ta symbol, which is used another 828 times in the Torah for a grand total of 3,450 times. Both the Aleph Ta symbols are written in just the Torah. This is significant and shows the value Moshe placed on both the Aleph Ta and the Wa Aleph Ta symbol. Moments away. I have to remember how to get through these little things that do not, that are not on my computer. There we go. I made it. Okay. This is the significant, this is significant and shows the value Moshe placed on both the Aleph Ta symbol and the Wa Aleph Ta symbol. Others are whole chapters in the no, I think this is there. There are whole chapters in the Torah in which Moshe only placed one or two Aleph Ta symbols. This prov proves the positioning of the symbols is based completely on subject matter. This is the only trans, uh, restored name translation I know of that focuses on the what the Aleph Ta means and why it was put in, in different places. A lot of what Brother Sanford goes through and explains here is that other words could have been used, uh, such as the word go or calm. So why use it the one, the meaning that had an olive ta in it? So he does a very good job of explaining. Just go and check it out and read it further if you're interested. The olive ta symbol does not take away from Yahuwah Father and his supremacy but enhances his characteristics and increases our understanding. It explains the mystery of who was represented in the manifestations of both the smoking cauldron and the fiery torch that passed over the sacrifices when Abraham was making covenant with the Yah head. That's Genesis 15:17. It further explains the pillar of smoke by day and the pillar of fire by night that protected the Yasharalim in the wilderness. These could only have been manifestations of Yahuwah Father as a consuming fire and Et Yahushua as the cloud, Exodus 33.10 and Nehemiah 9.19. In addition to the obvious, there are hundreds of Messianic prophetic scriptures in the Tanakh fulfilled by Yahushua the Messiah in the Brit Hadashah or the New Testament. Now we can look to over 9,000 Aleph Ta symbols in the Tanakh that further reveal to us how Yahuwah Father works with and through at Yahushua as one by one spirit to provide redemption for man. Ephesians 2.18, 1 
for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. These are just a few manifestations in the Tanakh that exemplify Yahushua as Messiah. He is visible in all seven feasts, spring and fall feasts, as shadow pictures of prophecies he would fulfill personally. Leviticus 23, 2 are where all the feasts of Yahuwah are found. He is visible in the creation symbolism of the water of sanctification or purification process with the sacrifice of the red heifer, Numbers 19, and he is visible in the ritual of cleansing the leper, Leviticus 14. He is visible in the creation and design of the tabernacle and the furnishings inside, which represent altogether the workings of the Yahed. Through him, Yahuwah created the world. Through him, Yahuwah made all the covenants with the 12 tribes. Through him, Yahuwah's righteous and sacred laws, the Torah, were given to the 12 tribes. Through him, atonement was made for us, first through the blood of animals and finally through his personal blood on Calvary, through the meaning of the names of Adam through Noach. His entire Basora or good news story is told. Through the meaning of the names of Jacob's children in the order of their birth, his entire Besorah story is told. Through the original meaning of the 22 Paleo-Hebrew letters in the order in which they are given from the Aleph to the Ta, the entire Besorah story is encapsulated, revealing all his characteristics from the beginning to the end and everything in between. Showing the works of the workings of Yahuwah Father through Et Yahushua Messiah and how he will redeem man. Through Yahuwah Father's memorial name, the Besora or good news story is revealed. The Yod is Father's hand, which brings the 12 tribes or the called out ones out of slavery. The He is Yahushua coming in the flesh as the Lamb of Elohim to provide his blood as redemption. The Wa is Father's hand pouring out his spirit to bind his covenant children with the Yah head and with each other, to guide us in truth. The last hay is to be fulfilled when Yahushua returns to save and collect his elect to reign with him during the millennial kingdom and forever. This is the reason why everywhere the olive toss symbol is placed in scripture. It reveals the workings of Yahuwah Father with and through Et Yahushua, the son of the Yah head expressing the strength of the covenants and working together as one in one spirit of uh, Ephesians 2:18 The olive toss symbol appears in every book of the Tanakh when the primary subject matter is to identify covenant peoples, persons, places, things or titles pertaining to covenant relationship and control by Yahuwah with and through at Yahushua of the Yahed concerning all of his creation there are olive toss symbols in regard to Yahuwah Father's judgments, blood atonement, and covenants, which imply both Yahuwah and olive toss working together as one. Yet there are also dozens of chapters where there is no olive toss symbol because the subject matter apparently does not merit the placement. So here I'm going to just pause and let you, or let you pause, and you can read this if you're interested. Otherwise, we'll just keep moving forward. Very interesting stuff. I just sort of unhighlighted it. And then we'll just quickly look here where he shares um, the Strong's numbers for et. This one with this vowel pointing is et, and this one is et, and this one is eight. This one is et, this one is eight, this one is ot, and this one is ot. And then also with the with the uh, wa olive ta here, it's wat and and wait. There are a total of seven thousand three hundred thirty nine olive ta symbols and an additional two thousand three hundred fifty two wa olive ta symbols used in the Tanakh, which bring the grand total to nine thousand six hundred ninety one. Rarely are any olive toss symbols related into English, except as an occasional erroneous preposition. 
However, all of the Wa'alif Ta symbols are translated with erroneous conjunctions because neither prepositions or conjunctions existed in the original primitive language of Babylonian Hebrew, which is what we call modern Hebrew now, or its predecessor, Paleo-Hebrew. If we want the truth of any matter, we must strive to return to its origin as it was first established and used. Truth has no agenda and it does not change. This is the principle of the law of first mentioned or first beginnings. So the Paleo-Hebrew versus Babylonian Hebrew, we'll touch on real quick. All we have to show, all we have to show us Paleo-Hebrew today and the fact that freestanding Aleph Ta symbols were used thousands of years ago is the language which has survived because it was carved on a hard surface such as stone. One such example is the Yehoash stone, which is 12 by 24 by 3 inches. Uh, and there's a centimeter in size. Supposedly found on an archaeological dig near the Temple Mount in Yerushalayim in 2001. Carbon-14 dating by Yisrael's Geological Institute under Shimon Ilani has authenticated the inscription as being at least 2,300 years old and helps to authenticate the timing of the inscription describing repairs to Solomon's temple as ordered by Solomon's descendant, King Jehoash of Yehuda in the 9th century BC. This is also in line with the biblical text of 2 Kings 12, 1 through 6 and 11, 17. The Jehoash stone tablet written in Paleo-Hebrew describes how the king instructed the priest to take Kadosh money to buy quarry stones and, temp and timber and copper and labor to carry out the duty with faith. The last three lines end with this promise. May this day become a witness to th that the work will prosper. May Yehua et ordain his people with a blessing. So this is the Yehoash or Jehoash stone. And this is Paleo-Hebrew. Starting from the top, let me see if I can pull this down here and read a paragraph, most of it. Starting from the top line, too, actually has a Paleo-Hebrew olive ta between the words collect and silver, corresponding with the fact many times when the Tanakh speaks of temple money, we see an et before silver or gold. Also in the beginning of line 10 on the stone, a Paleo-Hebrew olive ta is before the words breaches of the temple walls, which corresponds with 2 Kings 12.5. Here is some detail from this stone. This one has a ta and an olive in reverse order because it's kind of it's kind of hard to pull the olive and the ta. It's right here. Here's the this is probably line ten. Olive ta is here, and it talked about something in line um, two. It's a little difficult to see those because of the glare or something. But this is an olive ta right there, and here's Yahuwah's name Yod Hey Wah Hey on the bottom. But this one here is it's a little it's pulled up a little bit more so you can see it uh and then and this one we're saying here that this is this isn't a ta and an olive they're backwards here from an olive to a ta and um just to look at these two letters and knowing what each letter means and with the mashiach being inherent in the meaning of every letter you could see by looking at these two letters in the order they are written and read the sign is the ta of the completion. Ta means uh, sign and completion of the plan. Aleph is the plan. It also means I will. Vowels were not added to Babylonian Hebrew letters until sometime between the 8th and 10th century AD by the Masorites. Even the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were written approximately 2,000 years ago, primarily in Babylonian Hebrew, or also known as modern Hebrew, also known as Chaldean flame letters, have no vowel points associated with the Hebrew letters uh, back at that time. Some of these scrolls can be viewed online at this address, where you will clearly see the Aleph Ta symbols and the Wa Aleph Ta symbols, as well as Yahuwah Tetragrammaton on the scrolls. Babylonian Hebrew is what we know as modern Hebrew, but what the language is really called is Chaldean flame letters. Daniel, which means my El, or my mighty one, is judge, 
also known as Daniel, was told to hide the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Eric Bissell, uh, who teaches Paleo Hebrew in Erictology on YouTube, believes that Daniel was commissioned by Yahuwah through his messenger to obfuscate the Paleo Hebrew and to bring about a different language. Even the tribe of Yehuda lost the Paleo Hebrew language knowledge and were given a version of the language that was not pure. Brother Sanford continues, For thousands of years there has always been only one Hebrew language, but it has two different scripts. The exact date is unknown, but it is believed that around 597 B.C., the scribes began translating all the Paleo-Hebrew scribes into Babylonian Hebrew, and the language was replaced gradually over time. Credit is given to Ezra the scribe, whom refined the letters while in exile in Babylon. Thus, it is, thus is the origin for its name, Babylonian Hebrew. Unfortunately, there are no Paleo-Hebrew scrolls in existence today. It is believed that all the old scrolls, dis, scrolls disagre, disintegrated before Yahushua, the Messiah, was born. To summarize, the truth is, from the beginning, nothing has changed about how the Yahhead divinely functions with mankind and creation. The Yahhead is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changes not, Malachi 3, 6, our heavenly Yahuwah Father has been working in combination with and through at Yahushua as one by one spirit, Ephesians 2.18, from the beginning and all eternity. This is what the precise placement of the Aleph Ta symbols will clearly establish and is one of the main purposes for putting together this rendition in English. This is of monumental importance in beginning to understand our relationship with the Yahed, we can only grow together from here as more and more covenant believers begin to read the complete Tanakh and draw insight and revelation from the placement of these Olive Ta symbols. So that, of course, is, is uh, very easy to see in his uh, translation. However, such as the Hallelujah Scriptures, they have a Hebrew and English, and the Olive Ta is certainly there, as well as in other Hebrew sources, the Olive Ta's are there. Many believers are familiar with this symbol as representing Yahushua, the Messiah, but the simple truth of this matter cannot be completely analyzed until believers have the opportunity to read the Tanakh for themselves and see where this symbol is actually placed. Only then can we begin to understand its significance, for I believe our understanding of the Aleph Ta symbol has only just begun. I further believe the apostles understood completely the use of the Aleph Ta symbol in the Tanakh and pass that knowledge down to covenant apostolic believers in the assemblies they founded throughout Asia and the world. Much of their wisdom and insight has been lost over time due to the persecution they suffered by Rome. So we learn that Aleph Ta is all through the Tanakh, also called the Old Testament or the First Testament. The Tanakh really means the Torah, the first five books, which Moshe wrote, the Nebiim, the prophet's writings, and then the Ketubim, the poetry writings. Most of us were taught to basically disregard the what we knew to be called the Old Testament. There's nothing old about it, yet it is the ancient past that Yahuwah told us to ask for. It would be probably more accurate and put in a better light for us, perhaps, if we just called it the ancient past. So this verse is in Jeremiah 6.16. The ancient past, thus says Yahuwah, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient past, where the good way is, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls. For But they said, we will not walk in it. So that's what our ancestors did. And that's what many do today. But that is where Yahuwah calls us to do, is to go and read his instructions. The Torah means instructions. It does not mean law. There's other words that mean law, but Torah means instructions. Or instruction, Torah wrote is the plural of that, which would be instructions. And we now are aware that we came from one of those three sons of Noach, and they all had et on their names. So that means that there is a solid chance that we have an et, a strength of the covenant, Yehushua attached to our ancestor's name and identity and character and fame and renown. 
Here I want to show you so that you see the et before each of their names. We can hopefully agree, at least most of us, those who believe in the inerrant word of Yahuwah in the Hebrew scriptures, that we came from an ancestor with an et attached to his name, the strength of the covenant, Yahushua. So here it is in verse 10. We'll read it on the Hebrew side. This is the, or the English side. This is the Hebrew English hallelujah scriptures. And I really like this one. And Noah brought forth three sons, Shem, Ham, and Yepheth. And here we see there's Noah's name. Okay, Shalash, Shalasha, that is to bring forth. Benim, that's sons or children. Et, Shame. Et Ham and Et Yepheth. Okay, so those were the three that came off the ark. That was their little passport. They had their little Et on their name. So what is this covenant and what what's it all about? We're going to study that. This is This will not be a one recording study, but hopefully it will draw those who are sought after. I'm hoping to finish all of what I've prepared for you, which is about 40 hours here. Um, Three of the scriptures that Yahuwah has shared something special with me in are Yermiyahu 16, 16, 19 to 21, and Yermiyahu 33, 1 to 3. This is the book that we knew as Jeremiah, but his real name is Yermiyahu, which means the exaltation of Yahuwah. I'm going to share with you those now, um, so we'll just read them here. Here's verse 16 of chapter 16. See, I am sending for many fishermen, declares Yahuwah, and they shall fish them. And after that, I shall send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. This is a fishing. I am a fisherwoman sent to look for Ephraim, or the mascot name by which the ten northern tribes, the hidden tribes of the children of Yashorel are called. North also means hidden or secret. It's Zephon, like Zephaniah is Zephaniah, the hidden or the secret of Yah. This is chapter 16, verse 19 to 21. O Yahuwah, my strength and my stronghold and my refuge in the day of distress, the Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited only falsehood, futility, and there is no value in them. Would a man make mighty ones? For himself which are not mighty ones therefore see i am causing them to know this time i cause them to know my hand and my might and they shall know that my name is yahuwah this says you shall know that his name is yahuwah and it also says in the day of distress the gentiles those not keeping the everlasting covenant will come to yahuwah from the ends of the earth and say our fathers have inherited only falsehood futility and there is no value in them Another translation says falsehood and, in, and vanity in which there is no assent. Let's see if I can roll this up just the way I want to. I can't. Okay. This is chapter 33, Yermiyahu, verses 1 through 3. And the word of Yahuwah came to Yermiyahu a second time, while he was still shut up in the court of the guard, saying, Thus said Yahuwah who made it, Yahuwah who formed it to establish it, Yahuwah is his name. Call unto me, and I shall answer you, and show you greatness and unknowns which you have not known. This says, this one says, Yahuwah is his name. Call unto me, and I shall answer you, and show you greatness and unknowns which you have not known. What are the unknowns which you have not known? We could guess, but they are unknown to us until we begin to call upon his name. Here's what the unknowns are. The very things removed from those at the Tower of Babel. It was removed from them because there was nothing that they could not do that they wanted to do because they were all of one language. This is the unknowns, the Batsar things. That's what it means in this verse and that's what it means in Genesis 11 where Yahuwah came down and said, if we don't stop them, there's nothing they can't do. So these are the inaccessible things. They were made inaccessible. Earlier in chapter 16, we read that we had inherited only falsehoods from our fathers. And that, and then the very next verse said, Shall a man make Elohim, which are not Elohim? What Elohim did our fathers make? 
Our ancestors had a lot of infidelity in their activities serving Babylonian and Canaanite deities. That's why our ancestors were kicked out of the northern lands or the northern tribes of Yasharel. They were unfaithful and they did what they wanted to do, what seemed right in their own eyes to do. They were stiff-necked. They were rebellious. Yet according to the word of Yahuwah, our ancestors, our parents, were to hand down the word of Yahuwah and the knowledge of Yahuwah to us so that he would have offspring that would serve him and love him and obey him and call upon him and guard his name and his word and his commandments and marry only within their tribes and a few other commands to keep themselves pure among men. These were commands of Yahuwah. I took these photos um, this was yesterday, actually, from Me Messenger of the Names video, The Seal of Yahuwah, or The Mark of the Beast, Segment 1, Identifying the Seal. And here's um, a link to the YouTube video if you're on my Facebook, checking this out. Uh, let's read through a few of the verses here that he was sharing. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, Hear, O Yashorael, Yahuwah our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being and with all your might. You shall love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being and with all your might. Do we love Yahuwah? Do we regard him as our Elohim, our mighty El Shaddai, and love him with all our everything? That's what he's telling us to do there. Deuteronomy 6 verse 6, And these words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. His words spoken on this day are to be in our heart. Deuteronomy 6, verses, verse 7. And you shall impress them upon your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall impress them upon your children. You shall speak of them at all these times. I'm, I, I have a feeling that that's part of the issue with um, public school. Our children aren't with us when we rise up and when we, we sit down and when we walk along the way and when we're working, they're not there. They're, if they're in the public school system, they're being taught something else. In fact, the, the word for education is very close to the word for truth and belief. Deuteronomy 6, verse 8, And shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless, but frontlets between your eyes. You shall impress them upon your children. You shall speak of them at, at all these times. These words you who have spoke are to be bound to us as a sign on us. Verse 9, And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And we are to write these words on our homes and on the doorpost where people come into our home to visit us as well as on our gates where they enter into our properties to come and visit us. So it, so it could be that Yahuwah wants all our neighbors knowing about who it, who is it that we serve and or perhaps it has something to do with protection for our family against spiritual forces and plagues. He had um, the children of Yasharel in Egypt, he, uh, which is called Mitzrayim in, in Hebrew, he, he had them put the blood of Yahushua on the doorpost. And here he's saying, put my words on your doorpost. So there is a connection there. Verse 10, And it shall be when Yahuwah your Elohim brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Yitzhak, and to Yaakov, to give you great and good cities which you did not build. And here Yahuwah is mentioning the covenant of land that he promised to Abraham, to Yitzhak, and to Yaakov's seed, which we'll see in, in uh, the next time we do a recording here. Um, verse 11, And houses filled with all kinds of goods which you did not fill, and wells dug which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and you shall eat and be satisfied. So somebody else has done all this work for us or for our ancestors. Be on guard, lest you forget Yahuwah, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, or out of, the, out of Egypt, from the house of bondage. Be on guard, lest you forget Yahuwah, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, from the house of bondage. So did our parents teach us about serving Yahuwah? 
and writing his words on our doorpost and on our gates and teaching our children about serving him? No, they did not. My, mine didn't. My ancestors didn't teach me this. They taught me all they could or all they knew or what they thought was right, but I did not learn about Yahuwah. How do I know that most of you had the same upbringing as I did with regard? Because Yermiyahu, rather, 1619, tells me this. It says, O Yahuwah, my strength and my stronghold and my refuge in the day of distress, the Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited only falsehood, futility, and there is no value in them. Verse 13, fear Yahuwah your Elohim and serve him and swear by his name. We're to swear by his name, fear him and serve him. Verse 14, do not go after other mighty ones, the mighty ones of the peoples who are all around you. What happens if we forget about Yahuwah? What happens if our ancestors forget about Yahuwah? What happens if we are sent in exile to other peoples that we must then serve because they lord over us we go after other mighty ones they put up other mighty ones for us to serve and that's what happens they take our deity our yahuwah's name out of our english translations and they insert their own deity's names we're not the only group that that has happened to it happened to the babylonians it happened to the sumerians do not go after other mighty ones the mighty ones of the peoples who are all around you. When, when did that happen? It happens all around us every day. By us, by our children, by our friends, by others we know, by others we don't know. People speak other deities' names to us. We get infiltrated. Verse 15. For Yahuwah your Elohim is a jealous El in your midst, lest the displeasure of Yahuwah your Elohim burn against you, then he shall destroy you from the face of the earth. The displeasure of Yahuwah burning against you, and then destroying you from the face of the earth, surely that warning was sufficient for our ancestors to take our Elohim serious on this. But somehow, over the hundreds of years, the centuries after centuries, the being in exile for 2,730 years, we lost Yahuwah. Okay, let's look at the meaning of Brit, breathe, and then we'll start reading about what Yahuwah said about covenant. This is the Strong's Concordance, breathe. It's in the sense of cutting, it's a compact because made by passing between pieces of flesh. I know Code Searcher has been talking about this thing, this, this false doctrine, false gospel that's come out about being vegetarian. This is what Yahuwah had to do to start a covenant with Abraham. He told Abraham to divide these animals and then Abraham went into a deep sleep and Yahuwah went up and down between the pieces of dead animals. That's the way he did it. That's the way it was done. It's in our scriptures. So we just have to examine uh, what man brings up, and it sounds like it's good. It sounds like it's kadosh and set apart and sanctified to the Creator and making us more pure, but that's not what the Word said. So we have to go and check and see what did Yahuwah say. That's what we're doing. This Hebrew word means a compact made between parties by cutting flesh and passing through the pieces of flesh. This is a kind of covenant or pact. So we see here that it was used as covenant 264 times. This word berit is used and as league 17 times. So here's where it tells us in the Strong's Concordance. This is the next page. Um, it's, it looks really light on my screen. I sort of lightened this one. It's the only one I did, but I'm going to go ahead and read it. Berith means covenant, league, confederacy. The first occurrence of the word is in Genesis 6, 18. But with thee, Noah, will I establish my covenant. It is translated 15 times as league. Now, therefore, make ye a league with us. These are all cases of political agreement with Yasharel or between nations. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. The command had been also given in Exodus 23, 32, 34, 12 to 16, and Deuteronomy 7, 2 through 6. Covenant. 
The word is used for agreements between men as Abraham and Abimelech. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. Uh, Dawid and Yonathan made a covenant of mutual protection that would be binding on Dawid's descendants forever. This is an everlasting covenant. Um, in these cases, there was mutual agreement confirmed by oath in the name of Yahuwah. Sometimes there were, there was, uh, there were also material pledges. Ahab defeated the Syrians, so he made a covenant with Ben-Hadad and sent him away. The king of Babylon took of the king's seed, Zedekiah, and made a covenant with him and hath taken an oath of him. In such covenants, the terms were imposed by the superior military power. Um, they were not mutual agreements. In Israel, the kingship was based on covenant. Dawid made a league with them, the elders of Yasharel in Hebron, before Yahuwah. The covenant was based on their knowledge that Yahuwah had appointed him, thus they became Dawid's subjects. So they agreed to be in submission to him. This covenant is a league, a political agreement between nations or agreements between men. So we also see here a covenant of mutual protection binding on Dawid's descendants forever. So that means that wherever Dawid's descendants are today, they have been bound by their ancestor Dawid to protect the descendants of Jonathan whoever they are, and it indicates that in these cases there was mutual agreement confirmed by, um, I don't know why I put catch there, Con confirmed by, I think that was supposed to be oath, in the name of Yahuwah. Uh, then in number four above, we are told about covenants in which the terms were imposed by the superior military power. A might makes right power. Uh, do we know any countries today that force themselves on others and take what they want? If so, this country may be serving a mighty one that goes in and takes what it wants from other peoples and countries. There is one deity that I believe operates like this, and all of his mighty men serve him because he is into acquisitions and distributions unto those mighty men that serve him. This deity has a stronghold over the United States. He is the Babylonian deity of fortune, and his name is God. And here he is. Okay, and so this this word for God is in the sense of cutting, which is interesting because we just looked at where the covenants were cut. Um, and this God, they're pronounced the same, is fortune a Babylonian deity? It also means troop. Um, we've heard in English all our lives, God is good. Um, the word good in is a Hebrew word too. And it means to fall upon to attack for the purpose of taking what belongs to another person or entity, uh, country. Um, taking their goods. The goods are not the things that they own. They're the things that they stand to lose when someone comes in and takes them who's mightier than them. When we look at all the Gimel Dalit, this is a Gimel, that's a G, that's what we translate, transliterate as a G, and that's a Dalit, that's what we transliterate as a D here, there, it's right, right to, right to left in Hebrew and left to right in English, right? So there's your, that would, this G represents your Gimel right here, and your D represents the Dalit, okay? Um, so, all, if you look at all the Gimel Dalit words in your Strong's Concordance or any other Hebrew uh, dictionary or classical Hebrew dictionary or a concordance or a lexicon, you're going to see that the Gimel Dalit words have to do with um, elevating themselves uh, through a might makes right uh, distribution. The Kohen, Kohen Hagadol is the high priest. It's an elevation. Um, so some of the Gimel Dalit words certainly are positive and some are negative. Some are in the form of like a blessing and some are in the form of a cursing. Um, I think even cancer is uh, like a an overtaking and a cancerous kind of thing happens when you look through the Gimel Dalit words from the from Gimel Dalit all, uh, Gimel Dalit Aleph all the way to Gimel Dalit Ta. You're going to see almost a progression of 
of an elevation and then getting too big for their britches and then they go down. Um, at least that was my understanding when I looked through all those words. So we have, we have here Fortune, a Babylonian deity. His name is God. It is a Babylonian deity. It is a stronghold over English-speaking countries and especially America. It's on the lips of almost every English-speaking person. And, um, and Yahuwah is very jealous against this deity because it's a stronghold over his people. Uh, let's see if I have a hallelujah moments. Wait, let me grab this hallelujah scriptures. I didn't put it here, but I want to read it to you because I'm not on my computer. Hold on a second. I like to just kind of keep with the message and not get too caught up in the technology. So um, it's easier just to turn to the scriptures and read this one verse to you real quick. If you have a Hallelujah Scriptures, you will see this here. It's also in uh, version, study scriptures that have the Hebrew. Um, it's in the next to the last chapter of Isaiah or Yeshayahu, which means the salvation of Yahuwah. So it's significant to the, the name of the book and what the prophet Yeshayahu, which is his real name, what he was teaching. So I'm looking at... Yashiyahu chapter 65. Let's have to work around this camera here. Hopefully you see it there. Okay, and I'm looking at just verse 11. I want to read it to you real quick. It says, But you are those who forsake Yahuwah, who forget my Kodesh mountain, who prepare a table for God, and who fill a drink offering for many. And I shall allot you to the sword, and let you all bow down to the slaughter. Because I called and you did not answer, I spoke and you did not hear, and you did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I did not delight. The, therefore thus says the Adon Yahuwah, See, my servants eat, but you hunger. See, my servants drink, but you thirst. See, my servants rejoice, but you are put to shame. See, my servants sing for joy of heart, but you cry for sorrow of heart and wail for breaking of spirit, and you shall leave your name as a curse to my chosen, for the Adon Yahuwah shall put you to death and call his servants by another name, so that he who barak himself in the earth barak himself in the Elohim of truth, and he who swears in the earth swears by the Elohim of truth, because the former distresses shall be forgotten, and because they shall be hidden from my eyes now. For look, I am creating new Shamaim and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come to heart. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For look, I create Yerushalayim, a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I shall rejoice in Yerushalayim, and shall joy in my people. And let the voice of weeping no more be heard in, in her, nor the voice of crying. So anyway, I will stop there. But I just want to share a little bit from... Um, Yasha Yahu. So you can see that Yahu is not okay with this deity. There we go. Get back in front of this little camera thing. Okay. Here is, um, here's where we can find Gimel Dalit in the United States. He's on the money. He's attached to the money. In fact, that verse I just talked about was speaking about, uh, Mini, the deity of fate. After it spoke of God, the deity of fortune, fortune and fate. And here he is, in fact, the Hebrew word for blasphemy is gadoth, which sounds just like God off. So back to the meaning of, of the covenant, bereath um, in the Strong's Concordance. It means covenant, league, confederacy, the first occurrence in, okay, let's see, you know what, I read that one, so I just ended up in here twice. Um, and then, so here was the continuation of that. The great majority of occurrences of bereath are of Elohim's covenants with men, as in Genesis 6.18 above. Uh, the verbs used are important. I will establish my covenant, he says, literally cause to stand or confirm. Um, I will make my covenant. He declared to you his covenant, my covenant, which I commanded them. I have remembered my covenant, wherefore I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Elohim will not reject Yasharel for their disobedience, so as to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them. He will not forget the covenant which he swear unto them. The most common verb is to cut a covenant. 
which is always translated as in Genesis 15, 18, Yahuwah made a covenant with Abram. This use apparently comes from the ceremony described, um, what we talked about that one, the cutting of the animals, in which Elohim appeared as a smoking furnace and a burning lamp, uh, flaming torch that passed between those pieces. Those verbs make it plain that Elohim takes the sole initiative in covenant making and fulfillment. It's, it's as if Yahuwah chooses us, and then we decide if we will keep the covenant with him. The words of the covenant written in a book and on stone tablets, men enter into or join Elohim's covenant. They are to obey and observe carefully all the commandments of the covenant. But above all, the covenant calls Yasharel to love Yahuwah thy Elohim with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Um, Deuteronomy 6, uh, 4 through 9, we just read that. Elohim's covenant is a relationship of love and loyalty between Yahuwah and his chosen people. If ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a kadosh nation. Most bereath in the scriptures are of Yahuwah's covenants with men, which he establishes with them, causing it to stand and confirming the covenant with men. One thing is clear, Elohim takes the sole initiative in covenant making and fulfillment. Then men enter into or join them. Men are to obey and to observe carefully all the commandments of the covenant. Above all, the covenant calls Yasharael to love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with thine heart, with all thy soul and with all thy might and to obey whose voice and keep his covenant uh, is to be a peculiar treasure unto him above all people and to be a kingdom of priests and a kadosh nation. All the commandments shall ye observe to do that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which Yahuwah swear unto your fathers because he made that land covenant with Abram. In the covenant, man's response contributes to covenant fulfillment, yet man's action is not causative. Elohim's favor always goes before and produces man's response. So there again, Yahuwah selects us, and then we agree to keep it. Occasionally, Yasharel made a covenant before Yahuwah to walk after Yahuwah and to keep his commandments to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. This is like their original promise. All that Yahuwah hath spoken, we will do, they said. Yasharel did not propose terms or a basis of union with Elohim. They responded to Elohim's covenant. So he told them what it would be, and they accepted. The use of Old Testament and New Testament as the names for the two sections of the scriptures indicates that Elohim's covenant is central to the entire book. The scriptures relate Elohim's covenant purpose that man be joined to him in loving service and no eternal fellowship with him through the redemption that is in Yehushua HaMashiach. Um, covenant is parallel or equal to the Hebrew words debar or word, hok, which is statute, pikud, which is precepts, ada, which is testimony, it's also the word witness, Torah, which is instruction, not law, and chesed, which is loving kindness. These words emphasize the authority and favor Elohim making and keeping the covenant and the specific responsibility of man under the covenant. And then there is one more thing to bring up here, just so we know. Bereath is also a, Shem, a Shechem, a Shechemitish deity was named Bereath. Bereath. Okay. I wanted to begin our scripture search of covenant in the middle of Yahuwah's word less than 500 years before the Messiah Yahushua was born. So it's rather the middle of the story of Yahuwah's covenant with his people. We grew up learning that the name of the book was Malachi, but it's Mal Malachi. It is not the name of a person. It means my messenger. Malach is his messenger. What we call an angel is a Malach. Malach is my messenger. As in, 
my messenger of the covenant or the messenger of the covenant, I think is how it reads in whom you delight chapter three, verse one. I did a study last week on my own. I had to brush up on some scripture having to do with Yahushua being our Elohim. Those verses showed that Yahushua was the messenger of the covenant. So again, this covenant set up by Yahuwah and entered into between cut pieces of flesh by Yahuwah and us is a great thing to study. In Malachi 1, 6 through 8, a son esteems his father and a servant his master. And if I am the father, where is my esteem? And if I am an adon or master, where is my reverence? Said Yahuwah Zabaot to you, Kohanim, the priest, who despise my name. But you asked, in what way have we despised your name? You are presenting defiled blood on my altar. And when you present the blind as a slaughtering, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and sick, is it not evil? Bring it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? Said Yahuwah Zabaot. From the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name is great among nations. And in every place, incense is presented to my name and a clean offering. For my name is great among nations, said Yahuwah Zabaot. But you are profaning me in that you say the table of Yahuwah is defiled and its fruit, its food is, is despicable. And you said, oh, what weariness. And you sneered at it, said Yahuwah Zabaot. And you brought in plunder and the lame and the sick. Thus you have brought in the offering. Should I accept this from your hand, said Yahuwah, but cursed be the deceiver who has a male in his flock and makes a vow, but is slaughtering to Yahuwah what is blemished. For I am a great sovereign, and Yahuwah, or said Yahuwah of hosts, and my name is revered among nations. Chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 4 through 6. And now, O Kohanim, priest, this command is for you. If you do not hear and if you do not take it to heart to give esteem to my name, said Yahuwah Tzabaot of hosts, I shall send a curse upon you, and I shall curse your barakoth, your blessings. And indeed, I have cursed them, because you do not take it to heart, and you shall know that I have sent this command to you as being my covenant with Lui, the tribe known as Levi, said Yahuwah Zabaot, my covenant with him was high life and peace, and I gave them to him to revere, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. The Torah or truth was in his mouth, and unrighteousness was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and straightness and turned many away from wickedness. For the lips of a Kohen shall guard knowledge, and they shall seek the Torah from his mouth, for he is the messenger of Yahuwah of hosts. But you, you have turned from the way. You have caused many to stumble in the Torah, the instructions. You have corrupted the covenant of Louis, said Yahuwah of hosts. And I also, I shall make you despised and low before all the people, because you are not guarding my ways, and are showing partiality in the Torah. Have we not all one father? Did not one El create us? Why do we act treacherously against one another to profane the covenant of the fathers? Yehuda has acted treacherously, and an abomination has been done in Yasharel and in Yerushalayim, for Yehuda has profaned what is Kodesh to Yehua, which he had loved, and has married the daughter of a foreign mighty one. Let Yehuda cut off from the tents of Yaakov the man who does this, stirring up or answering and bringing an offering to Yahuwah of hosts. And this you have done a second time. You covered the altar of Yahuwah with tears and with weeping and crying, because he no longer regards the offering nor receives it with pleasure from your hands. And you said, Why? Because Yahuwah has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have acted treacherously, though she is your companion and the wife of your covenant. And did he not make one, and had, and he had the remnant of the Ruach? And what is the one? He seeks a seed of Elohim. So you shall guard your spirit, and let none act treacherously against the wife of his youth. For I hate divorce, said Yahuwah, Elohim of Yasharel, and the one who covers his garment with cruelty, said Yahuwah of hosts. So you shall guard your spirit, and do not act treacherously. 
You have wearied Yahuwah with your words, and you have said, In what way have we wearied him? In that you say, Every one who does evil is good in the eyes of Yahuwah, and he is delighting in them. Or, where is the Elohim of right ruling? Chapter 3 See, I am sending my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Adon, the master you are seeking, comes to his hey call, his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. See, he is coming, said Yahuwah of hosts, and who is able to bear the day of his coming, and who is able to stand when he appears? For he is like the fire of a refiner, and like the soap of a launderer, and he shall sit as a refiner and a cleanser of silver, and he shall cleanse the sons of Louis, and refine them as gold and silver, and they shall belong to Yahuwah, bringing near an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Yehuda and Yerushalayim be pleasant to Yahuwah, as in the days of old, as in former days. And I shall draw near to you for right ruling, and I shall be a swift witness against the practices of witchcraft, and against adulterers, and against them that swear to falsehood, and against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages, and widows, and the fatherless, and those who turn away as sojourner, and do not revere me, said Yahuwah of hosts. For I am Yahuwah, I shall not change, and you, O sons of Yaakov, shall not come to an end. For the days of your fathers you have turned aside from, sorry, from the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my laws and did not guard them. Turn back to me and I shall turn back to you, said Yahuwah of hosts. But you said, in what shall we turn back? Would a man rob Elohim? Yet you are robbing me. But you said, in what have we robbed you? In the tithe and the offering. You have cursed me with a curse, for you are robbing me, this nation, all of it. So turn back to me, and I shall turn back to you. This is talking about restoration of the covenant between Yahuwah and his people, Yasharel. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, and let there be a flood in my people, uh, and let there be food in my house. And please prove me in this, said Yahuwah of hosts, whether I do not open for you the windows of the Shamayim, the heavens, and shall pour out for you boundless baraka, blessing. And I shall rebuke the devourer for you, so that it does not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor does the vine fail to, to bear fruit for you in the field, said Yahuwah of hosts. And all nations shall call you Baruch, blessed. For you shall be a land of delight, said Yahuwah of hosts. Your words have been harsh against me, said Yahuwah, but you have said, what have we spoken against you? You have said it is worthless to serve Elohim. And what did we gain when we guarded his charge? And when we walked as mourners before Yahuwah of hosts? And now we are calling the proud Baruch. Not only are the doers of wickedness built up, but they also try Elohim and escape. Then shall those who revere Yahuwah speak to one another, and Yahuwah listen and hear, and a book of remembrance be written before him of those who revere Yahuwah and those who think upon his name. And they shall be mine, said Yahuwah of hosts, on the day that I prepare a treasured possession. And I shall spare them as a man spares his own son who sh serves him. Then you shall again see between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves Elohim and one who does not serve him. Chapter 4 For look, the day shall come burning like a furnace, and all the proud and every wicked one shall be stubble, and the day that shall come shall burn them up, said Yahuwah of hosts, which leaves to them neither root nor branch. But to you who revere my name, the brilliance of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and leap for joy like calves from the stall, and you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, said Yahuwah of hosts. Remember the Torah of Moshe, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb, for all Yasharel laws and right rulings. See, I am sending you Eliyah, the Nabi, before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahuwah. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with utter destruction. Eliyah, Eliyahu, means my El, mighty one, deity, is Yahuwah. And Eliyahu here to turn 
the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the their fathers. Oh, what a great day that will be. Hallelujah. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. We are going to look at some of the covenant verses. We won't have time for all of them. We are specifically looking to learn about the everlasting covenant. Many know that the very first word in the Hebrew scriptures is Bereshit or Bereshit. We are... We may know the word Rosh from Rosh Hashanah, head of the year, or from Rosh Kodesh, head of the month. Rosh means to shake the head. It means head, top. It means first. It means some. It can also be an individual animal or an individual person, like counting heads in a, in a party or a gathering. It sometimes means leader. It can be used of the tribal fathers. Military leaders are also called heads. It is used to those, used of those who represent or lead the people in worship, the chief priest or the head priest. When used of things as opposed to people or animals, it means point or beginning. It can also mean the top or summit of a mountain or hill or the topmost, the uh, end of a natural or constructed object. It is the head of a bed where a person lays his head. It is used to denote the ends of poles. It can be used of the place where a journey begins. It is used as the sum of the matters. It is also used to mean the place of beginning or being placed spatially in front of a group or at the head. There's a head of the stars located at the zenith of the sky. The head cornerstone occupies a place of primary importance in that it is the stone by which all of the other stones are measured. It is the chief cornerstone. It may have a temporal significance, meaning the beginning or the first. In Shemoth, uh, which means names, it's all, um, and we know it as the book of Exodus. 12 verse 2, Yahuwah says, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. This is in the spring, the month in which Passover occurs. It is not in the fall, the way many uh, who speak Hebrew and follow uh, Judaism keep it in the fall. But that's not when Yahuwah said the year begins. Rosh can be the first in a whole series of acts. Rosh also has to do with shaking one's head. Like the little abbreviation we often see someone use, shake, shaking my head, uh, SMH, they'll say. Or it can do with lifting up one's own head, a sign of declaring one's innocence. It can have to do with the hair on one's head. The word can connote unity representing every individual in a given group. It can be used numerically, meaning the total number of persons or individuals in a group. So now in Bereshit, the bet is in or with. That's what that letter means. Reshit is the first in place, time, order, or rank, specifically a first fruit. It is translated as beginning, 18 times, as first fruits 11 times, as first 9 times, and as chief 8 times. Race sheath means beginning, first choices. It is the beginning of a fixed period of time. It can see, uh, we can see it at the beginning of each year or at the beginning of one's life. This word can represent a point of departure as it does in Genesis 1-1, the first occurrence, of course, of race sheath. It can mean the first of the first fruits. It can mean first fruits. It can mean the choices are the best. And sometimes the word represents the first part of an offering. So if any of that's redundant, it's coming out of the Strong's Concordance that way. While we're here in the Strong's Concordance, Hebrew and Aramaic Dictionary, looking at these two Hebrew words, Rosh and Reshith, let's go ahead and learn a new word, Ra'ashoth. This word has the same exact letters as Reshith, except that it has no Yod, which is represented by this English Y here. So it's Roshoth. It means a pillow for the head. So first thing in the morning, you might be aware that your head, your Rosh, is on a pillow, a Roshoth. If we switch the Resh and the Sheen, we have Sharith in the word Bereshith. It would be Basharith which means a remainder or residual surviving, a final portion. When this word is found in scriptures, it is translated as remnant 44 times, as residue 13 times, 
as rest three times, as remainder two times, and as escaped one time. The idea of the remnant plays a prominent part in the divine economy of salvation throughout the Tanakh, as the remnant concept is applied especially to the Yasharalim, or the Israelites, who survived such calamities as war, pestilence, and famine, the people whom Yahuwah in his mercy spared to be his chosen people. The Yasharalim repeated repeatedly suffered major catastrophes that brought them to the brink of extinction, so they often prayed, Yashayahu or Isaiah prayed for the remnant which would be left after the Assyrian invasions. Mika or Micah announced the regathering of the Yahudim, the Jewish people, after the exile in Babylon. Zephaniah or Zephaniah identified the remnant with the poor and humble. Zechariah or Zechariah announced that a remnant would be present at the time of the coming of the Messiah's kingdom. All these notes and information are in the Strong's Concordance for further study. So we looked at Rosh, Rashith, Barashith, Rashoth, and Sharith. One more thing that I noticed the other day, it has to do with fire in the midst of the covenant. The word Barith is in the word Barashith. Can you see the ba there and the, the, the bear? And then uh, the eth part here, bereath. And then you have ash right here, an olive and a sheen. So when we talk, when we take off, this should say take, when we take off the first two letters and look at them in a word, we have bar or bore, which means the heir apparent to the throne, beloved, pure, empty, clean, bar in the sense of winnowing, grain of any kind, even standing in the field, a field, purity, cleanness, pureness, vegetable life from its cleansing, used as a soap for washing or a flux for metals. By the way, bara means to create or to make, to cut down, to select, to feed. So that word also is in the word in the beginning. But we are looking at uh, bet resh, bar or bore. Now let's look at the ash part, the olive sheen, ash or ash. It sounds a lot like ash and it means fire. In its first scriptural appearance, besides in the middle of a word such as here, Aish represents Yahuwah's presence as a torch of fire passing between pieces of animal flesh. Verse 18 tells us on the same day Yahuwah made a, a covenant with Abraham saying, I have given this land to your seed from the river of Mitzrayim, the Nile River, to the great river, the river Parath or Euphrates. See, there's the, the pay and there's the resh and there's the ta of parath. The remaining letters in this word are shin yo ta. So now we're talking again about, um, bereshit. I'm looking for it. Here we go. Bereshit. So we've looked at bar and we've looked at ash and now we're going to look at the, we were actually, we're looking at shin yo ta. So it's an overlap of those, those couple letters, but sheath. Uh, means to put, place, set, station, fix. Generally speaking, this word is a term of physical action, typically expressing movement from one place to another, often expresses putting hands on someone or something. It can mean to set boundaries or fix limits or to ask for limits to be set on oneself. It can also mean a dress as put on or a tire. It can also mean while growth of weeds or briars as as if put on the field or thorns. Uh, so I thought it was interesting. I believe you who showed me that besides in the beginning, we also have, since we are studying covenant, a fire in the midst of the covenant. And the first time that fire shows up by itself, it is in the midst of a covenant being made with Abram, who short, shortly after this became Abraham. So here's the first man, Adam, and he had uh, his wife, Hawa, we don't know her as Eve. She had an et on her name. I did not see an et on Adam. It doesn't mean it's not there somewhere. If I had uh, Brother William Sanford's translation focusing on the ets, I would have seen it very clearly, and I may ask him about it, but I did not notice an et with Adam's name. Uh, some of these other people, when it's mentioned more than once, I didn't see Annette always with their name, but they certainly had Annette the first time they were mentioned. I didn't see that with Adam. So Adam had uh, Seth or Shaith, 
and Enosh and Canaan and Mahalalal and Yared, all of these Hanok or, or Enoch, Methuselah, Lemek, Noach or Noah, Shame or Shem, Arpakshad, Shalah, Eber, Peleg, Reu, Serug, Nahor or Nahor, Terah, and Abram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and he had, uh, Yosef was one of his sons. I didn't check all 12 of his sons, but I have a feeling they all have ets, at least at the first of their name, and probably very, very on through to the end. Uh, in Genesis 49, Yaakov gives his, his latter days prophecy of each of his son's tribes. And I believe they're probably all there in that chapter. I haven't looked to confirm it, but I wanted to lay this out this way so you could kind of kind of break up the names so you could see them. But if we count from here, um, we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven is Enoch, eight, nine, ten is Noah, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Twenty was Abram. Okay, so I thought that was interesting. The other day I went through and counted those. Uh, Yaakov here, down to the 12 sons of Yaakov. Today, according to the research of Stephen M. Collins on where the lost tribes of Yasharel are, the United States and England are all her col and all her colonizations include the children of Yosef. At Ephraim, currently living in England, and the Brits and their colonies, and at Menashe, or Manasseh, currently the the living in the living in the United States rather uh, through his son Makir. I think I did some research and saw that he actually had two sons, but uh, I haven't changed that here yet. Uh, it's it's new knowledge for me as of today. But his son Makir supposedly is what became the United States uh, United States of America. So let's start looking at some scripture beginning from Adam to Hanok. There were seven generations, and Noah was the great grandson of. Hanok, Noach means rest. The very first place in the Hebrew scriptures where the word covenant appears in the Bereshit in the beginning, Genesis 6, 18, and Yahuwah is speaking with Noach uh, here where the, where the word is by itself. Make a window for the ark and complete it to an ama from above and put the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower second and third decks and see, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under the Shamayim, the heavens. All that is on the earth is to die, and I shall establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons, and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of all the living creatures of all flesh, two of each, you are to bring into the ark to keep them alive with you, a male and a female. Of the birds after their kind and of the cattle after their kind, and of all creeping creatures of the earth after their kind, two of each are to come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take of all food that is eaten, and gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. And Noah did according to all that Elohim commanded him, so he did. And Yahuwah said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation." And so, et brit, et my covenant, was what it said in the Hebrew here. And Elohim spoke to Noach and to his sons with him, saying, I, And I see I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the birds of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out, of the ark, every beast of the earth, and I shall establish my covenant with you, and never again is all flesh cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again is there a flood to destroy the earth. And Elohim said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for all generations to come. Again, Elohim speaks with Noah, and I believe this is in chapter 9. I didn't get this one written down. I shall put my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. 
And it shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I shall remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again let the waters become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the rainbow shall be in the cloud and I shall see it to remember the everlasting covenant between Elohim and every living creature of all flesh that is in the earth. And Elohim said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. And the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Yepheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and all the earth was overspread for them. And Noah, a man of the soil, began to plant and planted a vineyard. So the generations from Adam to Noah were ten generations, and the generations from Shem to Abram are Shem, Arpachshad, Shelah, Eber, Peleg, Reu, Sarug, Nachor, Terah, Abram, who was renamed by Yahuwah to Abraham. Shem to Abram are also ten generations. Again, Yahuwah picks his man with whom his covenant will be placed, Bereshit in the beginning, also known as Genesis 15:18, is our next sighting for the word Bereith covenant. For we are going to grab a little bit of con- we're going to grab a little, little bit of context first. Uh, we'll start reading in chapter 11 of Bereshit in the beginning, uh, Genesis 11, and to continue from there a bit. And Terah took his son. Abram and his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur Kazdim to go to the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Tara, Terah came to be two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. And Yahuwah said to Abram, Go yourself out of your land, from your relatives and from your father's house, to a land which I show you. So he called him out. And I shall make you a great nation, and Barak you, and make your name great, and you shall be a Baraka. So the name was very important. And I shall Barak those who Barak you, and curse him who curses you. And in you all the clans of the earth shall be Baruch. So Abram left as Yahuwah had commanded him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the beings whom they had acquired in Haran. And they departed for the land of Canaan, and they came to the land of Canaan. And Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah. And at that time the Canaanites were in the land. And Yahuwah appeared to Abram and said, To your seed I give this land. And he built there an altar to Yahuwah, who had appeared to him. And from there he moved to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent, and Bethel on the west, and I on the east. And he built there an altar to Yahuwah, and called on the name of Yahuwah. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And at that time the Canaanites and the Perizzites dwelt in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not all the land between you? Please separate from me if you like, if you like, if you take rather the left, then I go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I go to the left. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of the yard and that it was well watered everywhere before Yahuwah destroyed Sodom and Amorah, like the garden of Yahuwah, like the land of Mitzrayim or Egypt, you go toward Sor, as you go toward Sor. So Lot chose for himself all the plain of the Jordan, and Lot moved east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram dwelling in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelling in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent as far as Saddam. But the men of Saddam were evil and sinned before Yahuwah, exceedingly so. And after Lot had separated from him, Yahuwah said to Abram, Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward, and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see I shall give to you and your seed forever. 
and I shall make your seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could count the dust of the earth, then your seed also could be counted. Arise, walk in the land th through its length and th its width, for I give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to Yahuwah. And it came to be in the days of Am Amraphel, sovereign of Shinar, Ariok, sovereign of Eleazar, Kador la Omer, sovereign of Elam, and Tidal, sovereign of Goim. Verse 2, which I wanted to include, but it's on the next, um, the next column, says that they fought against Bera, sovereign of Saddam, Birch, sovereign of Amora, Shinab, sovereign of Adma, Shemeber, sovereign of Seboim, and the sovereign of Bela, that is Soar. Uh, and then verse 3 says, All these joined together in the valley of Sidim, that is the Salt Sea. And the sovereign of Saddam, and the sovereign of Amora, and the sovereign of Adma, and the sovereign of Seboim, and the sovereign of Bela, that is Soar, went out and joined together in battle in the valley of Sidim against Kedorla Omer, sovereign of Elam, and Tidal, sovereign of Goim, and Amraphel, sovereign of Shinar, and Ariok, sovereign of Eleazar, four sovereigns against five. And the valley of Sidim had many tar pits in the sovereigns of Saddam, and Amora fled and fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. And they took all the goods of Saddam and the and Amora and all their food and went away and they took Lot Abram's brother's son who dwelt in Saddam and his goods and left and one who had escaped came and informed Abram the Ebri for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre the Amorite brother of Eshcol and brother of honor and they had a covenant with Abram so all that to read that they had a covenant with Abram and when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in the, his own house and went in pursuit as far as dawn. And he and his servants divided against them by night and smote them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is on the left of Damasek. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the women and the people. So Abram the Ebri is what is it really says, but Ebri is Hebrew for Hebrew. In the recent past, I have run across some memes created and used on Facebook about what Hebrew means. This next meme is about a person who has crossed over from what she was taught to seeking truth from the Ruach HaKodesh, or the Sanctified Spirit, as we learned it to be named the Holy Spirit. The Sanctified Spirit of Emet Truth, which is from Yahuwah. I am Hebrew who crossed over from the pagan, man and demon-made religions, its practices and traditions to worshiping the one and only true El, Yahuwah El Almighty, El Shaddai, and keeping all of his instructions, the Torah, to the best of my ability. This meme says, if I can get it all up there, there we go. Discovering the ancient past, returning to our spiritual roots of ancient Hebrew. This meme says, Hebrew is the DNA of creation. And this is from William Sanford's uh, site on YouTube and also his website, All Tov Scriptures. And on the left here, you see the modern Hebrew, also known as the Babylonian Chaldean flame letters. And on the right, you see the paleo. Here's the Olive Ta, here's the Olive Ta, Yahuwah, Yahuwah. In the Hallelujah Scriptures, Yahuwah looks like this. And in the Institute for Scripture Research, it looks like this. It's also called the ISR 1998. This meme is about the Hebrew language being the DNA of creation, of all that was created. This meme, this meme shows on the modern Hebrew on the left and the Paleo-Hebrew on the right. This comes from one of William Sanford's videos on YouTube, and the title is something like The Difference Between Modern Hebrew and Ancient Hebrew. It is very amazing to learn from this video. I encourage you guys to get it out and check it out rather to go check it out and the next uh, meme shows the oldest recorded Hebrew and it's is Paleo Hebrew so there it is those are Paleo Hebrew letters 
a different font. And this, of course, in this photo, we see words encoded in the Hebrew language of our father, Yahuwah's word. All are still Hebrew. Um, uh, Ibrit. These are the kinds of things we see code searchers searching out in the codes of Yahuwah's word. They're in Hebrew. They're written here in English, of course, but the letters are Hebrew. They have to be searched in Hebrew. Okay, so 10 generations after Noah, Yahuwah established his covenant with Abram. We will begin there next time. We have set a lot of groundwork in a typical Hebrew circular way. I will be rather, it will be rather easy rather uh, now just to keep moving forward through the scriptures from the beginning. I thank you for bearing with me as I searched um, and shared some deep and deeply interwoven knowledge related to the covenants found in scriptures. We have looked at some of the very beginnings, where they come from, and now we're going to move it forward from Abram all the way to as far as Yahuwah's word will show it to us. Uh, many tens of hours have been spent in research and work and preparation, which must be done in order to share what I believe Yahuwah is leading me to present to you. It is not exactly the way that it was taught to me five years ago, for Yahuwah seems to have brought me in a different direction to share it with you. It is my heart and understanding that Yahuwah wants me to share with his people what he is calling them to and what he is restoring in these latter days after this 2,730-year curse that ended in 2009-2010. For people who are not, in fact, being called out by Yahuwah, I don't believe he has me sharing this message with those people, only those who are being called out by Yahuwah. Those that are being fished by Yahuwah. So thank you for your patience. Please subscribe to Code Surger's channel if you have not. Um, please share with your friends. And in these ways, you can certainly partner with us. Help us get the word out that we're sharing truth here. As we share with others around the world the restoration ministry of Yahuwah to his people. Please keep Code Surger's ministry and 12 tribes Ibri and our family in your prayers. Yahushua said the worker is worth his or her wages, Matthew 10, 10. And Paul reiterated this. We are ambassadors for Yahuwah and his son, Yahushua. Yahuwah cares for us and sees to it that our needs are met. This ministry gives an opportunity for others to join us in our ministry efforts. As we minister to Yahuwah's people around the world, we welcome you to partner with us and help us become more effective in our reach. Matthew 10, 41 to 42 says, He who receives a Nabi prophet in the name of a Nabi shall receive a Nabi's reward. And he who receives a righteous one in the name of a righteous one shall receive a righteous one's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones a cup, a cup, a cold cup full only in the name of a, you know what? Let me just pick that up real quick because I didn't get that right down and I want to get it right for you guys. So I can make the change later, but I just want to read it straight out of the word because I can't discern what I was writing there. Get over to 10, and then I can make the change later. Okay, I'm reading the last verse there. And whoever gives one of these little ones a cold cup full only in the name of a Talmud, that's supposed to say disciple. Truly, I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Lastly, may you fulfill the calling that Yahuwah has placed on your life. Please study and review what I have shared with you. If you seek for the truth, the way, and the life that Yahushua, the Hamashiach, lived and offered to us, shalom, there's a lot to unlearn and retrain in, given what Jeremiah 16, 19 to 21 said to us. If we are not friends on Facebook, I invite you for fellowship, and please allow me to be a gateway to meet others who have also crossed over and become Hebrew, learning and living the ways of our Father Yahuwah. Shalom. Also, please be aware that Code Searcher and I do a live stream every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Mountain Time. We're going to be beginning reading the book of Ena this evening, um, April 2, 2016. Please join us for fellowship as we begin to read this book that was preserved for the latter days generation. There is also talk about hosting a fellowship gathering in the word of Yahuwah midweek for us. So please be watching for that. Shalom, shalom. Abundant living in Yahuwah and in his, his son, Yahushua.